Good day and welcome to the Energy Storage Association, a beginner's guide to energy storage conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Sonora Monks. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone, and thanks again for attending today's webinar titled A Beginner's Guide to Energy Storage. I'd just like to remind everyone that all meetings and teleconferences of the Energy Storage Association are held in accordance with our antitrust guidelines. We ask that you abide by these guidelines during today's call. The full guidelines are available on ESA's website, www.energystorage.org. I'd also like to remind everyone that questions can be submitted at any time throughout the webinar via the chat box in, in your browser. Today's webinar is being recorded, and participants will receive a link to the recording following today's webinar. You will also receive a brief survey regarding topics and topics for future webinars, your feedback will ensure that ESA continues to provide the highest value information to you and your company. Today you will learn what energy storage means, what it does, its benefits, and its applications. Plus, you will get insight into the mission of the Energy Storage Association and hear unique perspectives from two leading companies in the industry. Our speakers today are Craig Horn, Vice President of Business Development at RES, Peter Muharo, Chief Strategy Officer at Pedernales Electric Cooperative, Rickson Chude, he's the Energy Storage Special Interest Group Professional Development Lead at the National Society of Black Engineers, and also Matt Roberts, who's Executive Director of the Energy Storage Association. And now to begin today's presentation, I'll turn it over to Rickson Chude for opening remarks. Rickson? Thank you very much. That was a great introduction. I'm very excited this afternoon to know about the many students and professionals interested in the, this presentation that we'll be discussing today. As mentioned, my name is Rick Sinchude, and today I'm here representing the National Society of Black Engineers. NSBE, as we call it, is the largest student-run organization in the United States. This organization, which mission is to increase the number of culturally responsible black engineers who succeed professionally and positive impact the community, has been working very hard to work on this mission. And this partnership and this first webinar that we're having with the Energy Storage Association is part of that first step. So how does NSBE meet this goal? We do this through a large network of chapters. Specifically, we have 242 collegiate chapters and 70 professional chapters, including as well 82 pre-collegiate chapters. That is going from, from middle school all the way to high school and also we cover the high school and the professionals, developing a big number of engineers that will be eventually participating in this industry, which is very exciting. Now let me talk to you a little bit about the energy storage, um, the Energy SIG, which stands for Energy Special Interest Group. This is a sub-program of NSBE, which was designed with its primary mission to support the career development of our members, providing technical development opportunities, professional networking opportunities, mentoring, and also collaborative learning. We work a lot on projects that impact the community. We have projects in Africa that we're looking to uh, start and develop with communities to develop uh, energy storage opportunities, solar installation, to make sure that these communities have access to energy, which is the primary start point for development of these communities. Our key objectives are essentially to become the source of information for the energy industry. Essentially, we want to become the hub for black professionals in the energy industry. And we do this by developing new collaboration with stakeholders, such as the Energy Storage Association. So we really look forward to continue this relationship and partnership with the Energy Storage Association. And that's it. At this moment, I'd like to introduce the Executive Director of the Energy Storage Association, Matt Roberts. Great. Thank you so much, Rick, and thank you, everyone, for uh, making time to join us today. Uh, definitely very excited to have this opportunity to speak with folks uh, across NSB's uh, BE's membership. So uh, great to be engaging both students in these topics and professionals and engineers uh, who are working on this. Um, it would be great to learn uh, in some of the follow-up about how many of you are already involved in the energy storage uh, industry. It's been taking off and just kind of growing leaps and bounds over the last few years. So it's uh, great to have this partnership and this opportunity to do this webinar 
talk about some of the basics of energy storage, um, and then also get perspective from uh, two very active members in the energy storage industry to give their perspective around how their companies are pushing this forward um, and what they see this net impact from energy storage on the grid will be. Uh, really quickly, looking at uh, a little bit more about the Energy Storage Association, we're actually 27 years old, uh, which is a little bit surprising uh, since really energy storage has gained a lot more prominence and been talked about a lot more over maybe the last seven to eight years. Um, for a long time, this organization worked with technology innovators and utilities and developers uh, to develop um, these technologies and these systems uh, and their high performance and capabilities that they have. And we'll talk a little bit more about that kind of technology diversity. But ESA has also grown to have a diverse set of members. So very fortunate to have people from around the globe, uh, companies that are really driving forward not just here in the U.S., but in so many markets for energy storage around the world. And it's continuing to uh, accelerate. And we'll talk some about that market growth. Um, up front, uh, I imagine many people have seen the headlines. Uh, that energy storage is a very exciting segment of the industry. Um, and in part, those headlines are being pushed by the great uh, narrative of how much storage is going into the grid. If you look at megawatt hours for total deployments in 2016, uh, the industry grew 100% year over year. So we saw about 158 megawatt, uh, megawatt hours go in in 2015 and uh, 336 in 2016. So seeing that growth, and not only is it the big front of the meter projects um, that uh, may be you know, 20 megawatts and up or, or other different sizes depending on where it's located on the grid and what it's doing, um, but we're also seeing the behind the meter section uh, continue to grow. So these could be smaller uh, systems installed in your house like a Tesla Powerwall or Mercedes-Benz or some of these companies that are focusing more on that segment, uh, or in office buildings and other types of uh, facilities as well. Um, one of the kind of interesting things uh, is uh, this market value question, and I'll come back to that in just a couple of slides. Um, but we're also seeing uh, cost declines for energy storage very significantly year over year, uh, continuing to bring those prices down. Um, these uh, cost numbers here are, are just used as a rule of thumb. Uh, there's a, a full spectrum of companies working on different technologies and different applications, um, and all of that will influence the cost of the system. Uh, but this is just a little bit of a benchmark uh, for people to get a sense of uh, some of those declines and how quickly they are coming down. And this is definitely not an industry of the future. I think one of the big things to point out about storage is it's here today. These systems are out there commercially operational, uh, providing value and services to the grid. Some of these systems have been online for five, six, or seven years. Um, and then there's also these kind of large sort of mega facilities in the form of pumped hydro. Um, and those uh, systems have been operational for decades uh, on the grid, um, providing some of these services as well. A lot of what I'll talk about today, though, is uh, what's sometimes called the advanced energy storage sector. Uh, so some of these uh, perhaps newer technologies that are uh, starting to provide more dynamic value than perhaps a large pumped hydro facility uh, is able to allow. Speaking of technology, um, there is a diverse array of technologies when we're talking about energy storage. Um, this could be everything from a high power supercapacitor uh, to a lithium ion or lead acid battery to a, a hydrogen and fuel cell technology or pumped hydro um, power storage. So varying uh, power capacities as well as uh, duration for these systems. Um, and this, again, is really just a benchmark. We're seeing dynamic solutions of all types, and even hybrid systems uh, going in as well, which may combine two of these technologies to make a more powerful system that has uh, some more dynamic capabilities. So while there are a lot of technologies out there to consider when we're talking about energy storage, what really, uh, you know, each of them may have a different mechanism inside or a different electrochemistry or a different uh, kind of physical component that changes how it stores energy. All of these technologies share similar performance capabilities, very rapid response time, so near instantaneous response to uh, grid signals or challenges on the grid or, or small variations in the balance of the grid. Um, or they have uh, other capabilities that are, are shared across all these technology types um, that are inherently valuable to the system. 
So while a lot of what you may hear about today is lithium ion, I think uh, there's a number of very high profile companies that are using lithium ion or perhaps lead acid technologies. Uh, maybe the two best known of the advanced energy storage world. Um, there is a wide range of different technologies that are at different stages of commercialization and different stages of demonstration on the grid as well. But this really comes down to what are these systems going to do? You know, what are they going to perform? What is their role on the grid? Um, this diagram hopefully kind of spells some of that out and gets into some of the different services and capabilities that these systems have. If you look at the middle circle there, you'll see that those are kind of big transmission scale um, uh, services that can be provided. And if you go around the outside ring there in the green, blue, and yellow categories, um, you can see sort of the different market structures that these uh, different applications will um, uh, provide services and value in. Um, I won't go into each of them, but maybe I could just point out one from each category to get a sense that there are many different ways that storage can participate uh, on the grid. Um, in the big ISO RTO services section, um, how our electricity markets are broken down in the United States. There are certain regions that are uh, grouped together into um, large service territories. Uh, and they have large wholesale markets that are kind of layered on top of those. Um, these wholesale markets do everything from providing energy and capacity, um, as well as a number of grid services. Um, and these are very essential services that ensure reliability, ensure your lights stay on, um, but also make sure that we can keep costs affordable while dealing with the infinite variation on the grid. Um, the grid is a real-time uh, supply chain. So when you flip on a light or, or you come into the office in the morning and, and turn on a bag of computers and flip on lights, somewhere just a little bit on the grid, someone's got to ramp up some generation to make sure that they will meet that demand in an instant. Um, energy storage is a very dynamic and flexible asset that has very quick response time as well, near instantaneous response time. So when those little variations happen, um, we're able to respond to those very quickly. And that's uh, in, our, uh, in the industry parlance what's called frequency regulation or frequency response. Um, this is a very valuable but, but very kind of wonky service that you probably don't hear a lot about, um, but it's critical to ensuring reliability on the grid. There's a number of these types of services, but there's also things that are a little more straightforward, like energy reserves, um, or uh, the idea of energy arbitrage, um, where you can absorb, say, cheap power or absorb renewable energy uh, during one part of the day, hold on to it for a bit, and then release it back into the grid at a different part of the day. Um, that type of arbitrage is something that is, is obviously the, uh, a main principle of energy storage being on the grid. And one of the largest challenges for our grid infrastructure is that there is uh, really not that much storage built into the supply chain. Uh, it's one of the lar it's the largest supply chain in the world that has uh, virtually no significant storage uh, outside of some large pumped hydro facilities and this increasing trend of advanced energy storage. Um, there are also uh, in that blue category there are a number of other sort of utility services. Um, energy storage can also simulate or replace the need for a transmission or distribution asset, um, and that allows uh, the battery or the, uh, the storage system to function as if it's a, a wire, as if it's kind of sort of a pipeline on the grid moving electricity. Um, and that can help uh, with cost savings and otherwise deferring expensive investments and upgrades uh, to a later date. Um, when we're looking at customer services, this may be the category that most people are, are familiar with. Uh, and this is the idea of, say, using solar power combined with a storage system at your house um, to uh, reduce your reliability or reduce your reliance, I'm sorry, uh, on the utility. Uh, or to, uh, so that you can consume more of your own energy or have backup power available for your house. Uh, these are some of the drivers uh, for these customer sited systems whether they be in a residential facility or in a commercial, industrial, a hospital, a campus for a university, um, all of those are places that would benefit from uh, the expanded use of energy storage. Um, the big takeaway here, though, is that 
this is very dynamic. There's a number of different services that storage systems can provide. Um, and it has a very large uh, systemic impact. It influences and kind of trickles out through all stakeholders of the grid. Um, by making a frequency response cheaper for the ISO RTO, they're able to procure that service and use less energy, which reduces emissions overall for everyone, lowers costs for ratepayers. Um, so these benefits that storage can provide uh, do really spread throughout the grid very quickly. Um, a very simplistic, and I will admit overly simplistic analogy is if your neighbor went out and bought a Chevy Bolt, but you got a $10 check in the mail. Um, you know, these are the types of things that uh, storage is able to provide by increasing that efficiency uh, throughout the grid. So I'll jump into um, one service as an example. And this is a big place that storage can play a role. Um, you may be familiar with a, a peaker plant, as they're called. So these are, are pretty fast responding, pretty dynamic natural gas plants, some of the, the latest and greatest technology in natural gas. Um, but in the end, they're still uh, these large fossil facilities. So they have to be on and ready. So they're idling, kind of waiting for a grid signal that calls upon them to help out. Um, and uh, often are really only used for a small portion of the air, very small, talking 7 to 10 percent um, for sort of the worst among the gas speakers that are out there in terms of what's called their utilization rate. In addition, they have a little bit of a ramp up time. They're, they're very fast compared to their predecessors, but it will take a few minutes for them to respond to something. Um, and when they're in standby, they'll have costs and emissions. You know, as we said, they're idling, so they'll be producing uh, emissions while they're waiting to be called up. Um, on an energy storage side, though, you uh, have a couple of big advantages towards uh, the gas speaker, which is sort of uh, today's solution. Um, storage systems, not only can they provide value when they're exporting power, when they're pushing electrons onto the grid, uh, but there also is value that can be created when they absorb energy, when there's too much energy on the grid. Uh, an example of that may be um, in a place like West Texas where there isn't necessarily a lot of load. There's not a lot of residences out there or big, big businesses. Uh, but there is a ton of wind energy. And so uh, you know, there are times when more wind energy will be produced than perhaps is needed by the grid at that moment. So instead of just shedding that wind energy or shedding any type of overgeneration, uh, we can leverage a storage system to absorb it and make sure we make good use of it. Um, so it does have value on both sides of the equation, both when it's absorbing and when it's discharging energy. Um, it can also provide simultaneous services, as we noted before. So not only can it fill the role of the speaker plant, but it may also be providing another value stream at the same time. Uh, so it's able to replace multiple functions uh, of traditional assets um, within a single system. Um, and then within standby, there's no costs or direct emissions. Uh, I will note that when you have a uh, technology like this, and it's sitting there. It does have basically an idle mode the same way that a peaker would. But for that, there may be uh, some small cooling fans running and a computer running that's monitoring these systems. Um, you're not actively burning uh, you know, natural gas or some other fossil fuel while they're sitting there in idle mode. Um, I promise this will be the most complicated slide that I have in my deck, um, and we'll be jumping into one of our next presenters here in just a sec as well. But um, this is sort of looking at market dynamics. So I know some folks on this call will be interested in kind of how these markets are coming together. Um, this kind of really quickly summarizes what's going on in the or what uh, had happened in the PJM marketplace a couple years ago. Um, so why storage was so successful in PJM? is because they created a mechanism. Uh, I apologize. Uh, PJM stands for Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland. Uh, it's a multi-state market that has um, wholesale uh, clearing prices and wholesale market mechanisms. Um, PJM, uh, under direction from FERC, uh, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, created a pay-for-performance um, product that is related to the regulation of the grid, that frequency we were talking about before. And um, that provided a large incentive for these uh, energy storage systems to get engaged in this market and provide this regulation service. 
So not only were these systems able to perform better, they're faster responding, um, they're uh, you know, very dynamic in terms of being able to switch from charging to discharging and back and forth, uh, they also were able to help lower the overall demand for this product. So they're reducing the amount of energy that uh, the, and TJM is the largest energy market in the world, they're reducing the amount of energy that this market needs to perform this function. And that equates into emissions reductions, cost savings for everyone who lives in the four or five states that are serviced by PJM, um, as well as just better overall efficiency and function within uh, the grid system there. So these systems have a very real impact, but it does take market drivers uh, to move them forward. Um, one of the things that's often noted is about costs. Um, so this is a, uh, definitely a simplification. Um, it's drawn from a few different sources of information. This is for one technology type, but hopefully just gives a sense of how this is coming down. Um, so costs are dropping quickly, not just on the cells themselves, um, you know, the lithium ion cell or the lead acid cell, but also the balance of system costs, which is where a lot of the costs can be. And this includes everything like inverters, um, power switching equipment, um, you know, different kinds of safety equipment and monitoring equipment. Um, those things all have a, a cost that, that is dropping very quickly as well. Um, and that's also spurred by advancements in renewable energy and other uh, energy, advanced energy systems um, that are also using or sharing these same technologies, helping to drive those costs down. So cost coming down is half of the equation. Uh, but the other thing that is of major consideration and really where the biggest challenge lies for the energy storage industry is on the value of systems. Um, this chart has a lot of information on it, but the key takeaway here is with all these different services, there you can see a widespread and, and really not a lot of agreement when you look at some different reports around valuation. Now this doesn't mean that these valuation reports are starkly different. Um, what this demonstrates is that when you look at an individual case or you look at an individual location, you're going to get a vastly different answer. Um, and sometimes there'll be a lot more, um, uh, you know, a lot more information uh, available for certain, say, uh, for certain installations than for others. So we're seeing um, this kind of widespread on valuation. So when you look at any individual system, uh, the types of services it can provide, uh, where it's installed on the grid, um, how close it is to the load, or how close it is to the generation site. All of those will influence the value of an energy storage on the system. And I'm sure when uh, Peter gets into his section, he'll dig in more about some of the value they see uh, for these technologies on the distribution grid. Um, I'll move through the last uh, couple ones here quick, and then we'll, we'll get on to our next speaker here. Um, systems are going in across the country. We've definitely seen a lot of growth in the industry. Um, I've marked these two numbers in red for 2016 because this is actually a, a fascinating anomaly. Um, up top, we're looking at how many megawatt hours of energy storage systems are going into the grid in the United States. On the bottom, we're looking at industry revenues. As you can see, from 2015 to 2016, we doubled the amount of energy storage that went in. But we saw a decrease in market revenue. Uh, that's a really interesting phenomenon, and it's because, uh, in large part, because system costs are dropping so fast. Um, and we're looking at larger systems going in that will have more megawatt hours per system. So those two dynamics combined kind of create that interesting effect um, where uh, it looks like the industry shrank on a dollar's uh, amount, but really it's continuing this uh, steady growth upwards overall, and we're seeing these megawatt hours and bigger projects go in, uh, not just here in the United States, but around the globe as well. Um, let's see here. Um, so uh, at this point, I'm actually going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Craig Horn. So hopefully this gave a good sense of um, kind of, you know, the basics of this industry, some of the things that we're seeing here in the United States. Uh, the U.S. is definitely the leading market now and has been a driving force for innovation in energy storage. Um, but uh, we've continued to see this take off in other markets as well. So definitely looking forward uh, to future opportunities uh, to speak with this group and, and speak with all the great members of NSBE. Uh, and thank you again for making this opportunity. 
Um, but I will now turn it over to uh, Mr. Craig Horn, who works for a great company called Rev, and he will be able to give a little bit better perspective from a project developer's uh, uh, standpoint, and also talk a little bit more about um, some of the things that his company has been working on. So, Craig, please take it away. Okay, Matt. Uh, thank you. Uh, hopefully coming through clear. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with everybody today, and I welcome the opportunity. Um, what I'd like to give you is a developer's perspective on energy storage. Um, over the course of my career, I've worked both on the technology development side and on the developer side, as well as uh, been serving on the board of ESA these last uh, three and a half years, currently as secretary. So um, I'd like to be able to give you some of that perspective and lessons learned. But, but to begin with, I'll give you some background on RES as a company and then uh, some of the specific things we've been doing in energy storage to give you some context, and then uh, close out with some of the different jobs, uh, cap uh, opportunities uh, in a company like ours. <clears throat> so our uh, company goes back to the mid-1800s. It's a uh, privately owned company um, from the McAlpine family. They're a large uh, construction firm. Uh, they own a large construction firm, Sir Robert McAlpine Construction. It's a you can think of it like as a, as a Bechtel, uh, located and does work in the UK. Um, projects over the course of their life has spanned from the uh, Glenfinnan Viaduct in Scotland, uh, which may look familiar. It's the uh, aqueduct that the train uh, at the beginning of the Harry Potter movies, the train on its way to Hogwarts, uh, goes over, uh, as well as the Olympic Stadium in 2012. And that uh, stadium was built without any lost time to accidents. So safety has been a big focus uh, of, the, of the company, part of its culture from the beginning. Uh, Res started off as an offshoot from the Sir Robert McAlpine Corporation in 1982 and uh, focused on wind development. So we uh, are a fully 100% um, focused on uh, renewable energy development, including storage. So our portfolio you can see here uh, over the last uh, about 35 years now, we have about 10 gigawatts of wind uh, in the ground. About 80% uh, of that has been here in uh, North America. Uh, 400 megawatts of solar, um, two 100 megawatt uh, PV farms, one in uh, um, Central Texas and the other in Southern Colorado within that portfolio. And in storage, um, we're number two globally with 147 megawatt portfolio. And I'll talk more about that here in a second. And then uh, we also have done a significant amount of transmission. I also want to mention in wind, we're number two in the U.S. in wind with that 8 gigawatt uh, portfolio. Um, whether it's wind, solar, storage, uh, our approach is the same as we're basically are very er vertically integrated from development all the way through uh, operations. Uh, we have a pretty significant asset management arm. Um, but one thing we don't do is the specific technology itself. So we don't make the wind turbine generator, we don't make the solar panels or the inverters, and uh, same thing with the battery and PCS. What we do is we source uh, the best of uh, to fit the project needs, whether you know the typical axes of consideration are cost, performance, and or schedule. Um, and we work with a number of t uh, tier one vendors in order to uh, get that best fit for the project itself and put that in. And then we have our own proprietary uh, controls platform Resolve that we use in, uh, you know, across the board and especially in storage. Um, oops, do the advance here. So in, in terms of storage itself, uh, you know, we have uh, that 147 megawatts is spread across 15 projects. Um, we're doing over 10 different storage functions uh, uh, with the Resolve control system. Uh, we're operating in eight different uh, electricity markets or operational uh, areas, as uh, um, Matt had talked about PJM. That's one we have a significant footprint in. Uh, we worked with six different battery vendors and have had due diligence by a number of utilities and financial investors. Uh, some of our projects have gotten the first non-recourse senior debt financing for front of the meter energy storage, so we're pretty proud of that. Um, uh, you know, getting through that process with investors. Uh, the systems we put in have been pretty much across the board of the applications that Matt talked about, standalone, utility integrated, and PV integrated systems. And um, I mentioned our uh, number two standing in, uh, in 2015, we had a 31% market share of the megawatts in the ground. I mentioned safety. You know, home safe every day is, is part of our company culture. 
Um, we do have a pretty significant safety standpoint. You'll see here in a second why that is, but you know, when you're dealing with uh, 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 pieces of equipment this large and uh, power uh, systems this large, safety has to be uh, part in there. So as you think about energy storage and uh, you know, the renewables industry as a whole and, and opportunities in there, know that, that safety is going to be an important aspect of your job. To look inside a storage plant, really what we're talking about, um, I think this is a representation here to uh, provide an orientation of a typical, what I call an energy storage power plant or ESPP. It's different than a system, um, I'd say. You know, you can think of an energy storage system as something at a resident house, actually even in a vehicle. But when you have a grid attached system, um, you're under a contract with a utility or you know, you ha have obligations with a system operator, you're bidding into the market that Matt talked about. And really what you're doing is you're delivering or absorbing megawatts of AC power for a given duration, you know, a number of hours. So rather than think of it as MWH, like megawatt hours of how much storage capacity I have or energy, energy storage capacity, you know, you have to design these plants to deliver megawatts of AC for hours or what I use as a unit of MW-HR. Um, that really tells you how you need to design the battery energy storage units, which uh, in this case, this is one of our first projects. It's rated at uh, four megawatts and would last uh, approximately 30 minute duration. Um, it has two different 40 foot containers that are filled with battery cells. In the middle here is a container that has the power conversion system, or PCS. So that's converting the uh, DC gener uh, power um, from discharging the batteries into AC. Typically, that comes out at 480 volts for systems here in the US. And so then you have your MV step-up transformers from 480 to you know, 10,000 to 34K, something like that, distribution um, uh, voltages. We have, uh, you know, your grid interconnection at some point within the uh, scope there, and then also your cabinet here with the energy management system and the SCADA. So those are the, the kind of breakout on a hardware basis of the, the five different main components that you would have in, in one of these, these systems themselves. And uh, they really take that battery unit and make that into a dispatchable AC power plant. Um, just here's some uh, pictures, give you some insight of what actually takes place as one of these is going into the ground. Um, you know, you have civil works with site prep laying out foundations. You can have piers up here on the upper left uh, or on the upper right, more of a pad type thing. The containers themselves come in, you know, pretty large rigging um, cranes. They're, they can be pretty heavy. Uh, they can be man accessible like you see here on the left. On the right are, not, uh, I think, is more of a growing trend in terms of uh, enclosures where they're non-man accessible. So the uh, battery, um, uh, uh, the battery trays themselves are loaded in externally, and they're all externally uh, accessible, like you see here in the bottom right. Um, these pictures uh, on the the right column are taken from the. Uh, Escondido storage power plant that AES uh, put in uh, late last year with um, uh, for San Diego Gas and Electric. These here on the left are uh, projects that we've done here at Res, uh, the Jake and Elwood projects in Illinois and Puget Sound, uh, one for Puget Sound Energy in uh, Glacier, Washington. <clears throat> so the types of jobs here at Res, uh, there's some nice formatting things here. Um, really span you know across the board. Um, uh, you know, analytics, engineering, project management, and then on-site construction, you know, as well as maintenance. You know, from an analytics side, we both look at, you know, how the market rules and, and prices go. Uh, those go into financial pro forma. And then when we understand those rules, you know, those give rise to use cases or time series that we can put in as simulations of performance to look at degradation and really help us size uh, and cost out the, the, the storage units themselves. In many cases, you know, they, they would be battery-based, but, you know, flywheel, the other technologies, uh, you know, Matt talked about, also generally applied here. On the engineering side, mechanical civil for site layouts, configuration, HVAC, uh, you got your, you know, uh, electrical really, on, you know, on uh, uh, power delivery side, um, switch gear is, is a pretty important component here. 
um, as is this third category, controls and SCADA. So interfacing you know, with the system operator the utility control rooms is something that's non-trivial and uh, this is quite, uh, um, uh, I think, a valuable set of experiences in the industry themselves. And then, of course, you have uh, engineering of the, the battery and PCS units themselves. Typically, we buy those from vendors, but we still need to understand what's going on the inside of them for things like code compliance and making sure that we can meet the requirements. And this type of uh, uh, activity has uh, analogies if it's a solar farm with PV inverters or uh, the wind turbine generators on a wind farm. Uh, project management, you know, the th different things in um, making sure things get done on time, they're estimated correctly, uh, you know, you have your documentation in order and everything else that you need to uh, um, uh, manage a project. And then on-site things, you know, from the examples I showed before, electricians, riggers, even truck drivers, um, you know, would be uh, fine uh, opportunities here in storage. And then, of course, O&M technicians and things like that. Uh, of course, uh, with any company, HR and administration and business development sales go hand in hand, uh, driving kind of the front end of, of these types of activities. One thing to be aware uh, on the development side is you, a lot of these jobs are geographically diverse, meaning that you're moving from place to place. So this just shows an example of the geographic diversity of our wind portfolio you know, throughout the U.S. and Canada. So some of uh, the folks that are on board at RES with our construction teams are actually moving around quite a bit from state to state um, and then, you know, home on weekends and, you know, at other periods of time. If you are interested, we have uh, all our openings uh, posted on our website. So you can see the, uh, the URL here. We not only have offices here in the U.S., but in other regions around the world. So. Um, if you have friends out there, this is a place where they can always look to see what, what is available uh, out there at RES. And so um, I want to thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions at the end. So I'll hand it over now to Peter. Thank you, Craig. Appreciate it. And um, Matt as well. Um, excited to be speaking uh, at this webinar and, um, and, and um, also just conversations with Nesby and organization I have been involved with before. Um, I will give the utility side of energy storage and just talk about what, um, how energy storage plays on the utility side of uh, business and the opportunities that exist. Uh, but before I get started with that, I thought it was a good idea to just put some basics out there. There are three different kinds of utilities that you'll see um, in the U.S. is investor-owned utilities, uh, which are usually you know, publicly traded companies, um, mostly large sub, just primarily um, urban areas, but some do serve some rural areas, and um, typically regulated by the state um, and what the Public Utility Commission uh, is who regulates it. A good example of that is Duke Energy. Um, as an investor-owned utility, you can think of uh, PG&E and a few others. And you have municip municipally owned utilities, well known as munis, uh, once again, owned by customers, um, but this time regulated a little bit different by locally elected um, officials, and in some cases also the PUC. A good example is Austin Energy. And of course, lastly, is electric co-ops um, owned by the customers, uh, created to serve rural um, areas of America, but do serve some urban areas, uh, regulated by an elected board of directors. In some cases, there are some states that uh, the PUC does regulate it, and a good example is us, and I'll get to talk a little bit about us uh, some more. Um, just to give you an idea on how um, this looks, when you look at average consumer served, um, investor-owned utilities on average serve about you know, a little bit of a half a million. Um, munis um, typically serve about 10,000, and electric co-ops about 22,000. So uh, quite a difference in the way the number of co um, consumers are served. So just to talk a little bit about uh, electric co-ops, there are over 900 in the U.S. who serve uh, about 42 million, um, uh, population of about 42 million, and cover 75% of the landmass in the U.S. So uh, when you look at rural America, it uh, was never going to get electrified un until electric co-ops came about. Um, and the map on the right shows you just all the green areas where electric co-ops um, touch. And so 
Um, not surprising, you may be coming from a town that was served by an electric co-op, um, and you may not be aware of it. <clears throat> Usually, um, they deliver about 11% of the um, energy that's sold in the U.S. <clears throat> Excuse me. So co-ops, they operate under the typical cooperative principles, uh, seven co-op principles. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you'll find this across uh, pretty much most co-ops, including places like REI, uh, Land of Lakes, and um, a few other places, which are all electric co-ops. <clears throat> so to talk a little bit about us, we're the largest electric distribution co-op in the U.S. Uh, we're purely a poles and wires company. We deliver energy. Uh, we have some small generation, but primarily we just deliver energy. Um, cover, um, we're west of, uh, west of Austin, northwest of San Antonio. Um, Pretty big territory. We've got about 280, um, we're actually close to 290,000 accounts at this point. Um, everyone is moving to Texas, so uh, we added about 12,000 meters last year and um, really strong 700 plus employees who, uh, <clears throat> who helped to run um, the company. So a little bit of, about our power supply and, um, and the reason why I show this is because it is important to understand why storage is critical. Uh, we buy power from the Lower Colorado River Authority, who is our large power provider, and we are required by contract, 65% of our load, to come from them. The 35% could be anywhere else. We could purchase that on the market. We can choose to self-generate um, <clears throat> or, or, or whichever options um, we choose to. And we're in the ARCOT uh, market, so that's a little bit different than the PJM, as Matt was talking about. And so. The reason I show this is it allows us some flexibility in how we're able to procure certain things, and um, I'll get in a little bit more of the benefits of why do we think energy storage has potential for utility um, and as we see how we manage our power. Uh, Matt did touch a little bit on, about that, for example, in West Texas where you can generate a lot of wind, but um, in, in times when you need to uh, that you, you don't have the load specifically, so energy storage can be the bridge um, that can solve that. <clears throat> As you can see from this slide, there are definitely uh, several applications um, from a generation standpoint, from transmission and distribution, as well as the end use side of it. I won't spend much time because Matt touched on something very similar to this. What I will spend a little bit of time is just talking about what do we see um, as applications from the utility side of it that we can uh, benefit from energy storage. Um, we know that certain grid services, such as frequency regulation, that are critically impo important. Um, we do have something here in, in ARCOT that we call um, the emergency response service, um, where you get paid to uh, have a system that can respond at any time. Um, of course, there's always the UPS side of it that um, uh, some entities may need for reliability reasons. Um, we do see the side of um, uh, peak, manage, uh, peak management as you want to uh, shift your load, for example, um, things such as transmission fee mitigation, um, demand charge mitigation, and the like. Uh, renewable integration, we've mentioned a little bit about that, and especially when you look at the, um, where you've got great renewable resources and yet not enough load. And so how do you you know, um, um, shift some of that, how do you farm that, how do you smooth it to make sure that um, it, it serves your, um, um, it serves your, uh, your load the way you'd like it to. And lastly, power quality is always a critical thing and reliability, um, and so we know that storage can provide several different um, uh, applications uh, and benefits when we look at how power quality and reliability uh, plays a role. So let's talk a little bit about energy in Texas, and this is where I'm going to get into the last few minutes of my talk on why storage is important. Um, they say everything is bigger in Texas, and it, it is true. We're uh, the largest consumer. Um, about 12% of the nation's um, energy is uh, consumed in Texas, and I think the joke is if Texas was its own country, we would be about the sixth or seventh largest consumer of um, of of energy in, in the world. Uh, demand has increased uh, quite a bit. We, we see a lot of people moving to Texas, a lot of companies moving to Texas. If you look at Forbes, um, top 10 fastest growing, five of the cities 
are in um, in Texas, and in fact, we serve two of two of those counties. Um, the two fastest growing counties are in our territory. One thing that we've seen is cost of transmission. PEC has experienced over 90% increase since 2010, and that is a cost that continues to increase. And so we have to use storage as a way um, to find a way to um, mitigate some of this cost of transmission that um, in some cases have nothing to specifically do with us. And so when you look at our market, if you look at 2016, the average wholesale power price was $24 a megawatt hour. To put that in better perspective, 2.4 cents a kilowatt hour is what the wholesale price was. The market allows it such that if at any point those um, we came to nearly our reserves or whatever the case is, that it could cap up to $9,000 a megawatt hour. So that's $9 a kilowatt hour, almost 400 times what the average wholesale price is. In cases like this, uh, issues, things such as arbitrage become very important um, to find a way to mitigate such a scenario. Now, um, because of the way our card is set up, we know when those times could potentially happen. And so we're able to see, um, we're able to see how can we mitigate some of this cost in the case of this happening. So as we do our calculations, uh, we're really evaluating this as a critical piece, cost of transmission as a critical piece as well, and also we look at other benefits that we could get out of it, including um, things such as uh, looking at um, uh, transmission and distribution deferral of, of some of the assets that we have. So just thought I would mention a quick project that we're working on um, with the state of Texas. Um, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality um, ha has uh, awarded us some money and we're negotiating with them at this point on putting a battery system, a two megawatt, four megawatt hour battery, so that's two megawatt for two hours, um, is what we would uh, we, we, we propose to the state. And we ran the economics to say, how does this really play out? And I, I have to say, based on the cost, we see the projections really coming very favorably. And this project will be able to demonstrate. This is one of, we've got a few others. I just, I didn't have enough time to go through all of them. But I just thought I would highlight one of this in terms of how storage, you can look at it now from a planning standpoint, which is typically not what utilities did. Now we can begin to integrate this and say, can this actually provide value as we look at our long range planning from a utility standpoint? So. Um, it's something that's going to be a public project. You can read about how we go about it. And, um, and in fact, for NSB um, uh, uh, students, uh, if, you know, we're actually engaging a lot of um, some of the universities locally to work on this project as well. So some great opportunities. Um, just in closing, I wanted to just highlight, um, you know, you wonder what a job at a co-op would look like. Um, we've got several different areas that uh, we've hired and we'll continue to hire. Um, a key hot area is green modernization, that we're constantly um, looking for engineers who are forward thinking um, and, and, and are aware of new technologies, and also just the regular system engineers, distribution and transmission folks. Um, uh, something that's really key is looking at cybersecurity um, on some of these devices as well. So. Um, with that, I think I'll pass it back over to um, um, to Matt, or I'm not sure yeah. who's going to after this. Uh, yes, this is me. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you again, Craig. Uh, great to have both of you provide some more perspective uh, around uh, how this is actually uh, manifesting itself, how it's actually coming to fruition out in the field. Um, I will note we'll do some Q&A here in just a sec, um, but first I do want to thank everyone again from NSD uh, for helping us bring this together and, and getting this great audience together. Um, you can ask questions uh, into the chat box, and then we'll jump into those uh, here in just a sec. Um, in addition, I do want to note um, at our annual conference, so ESA, uh, the Energy Storage Association, we host an annual conference this year in Denver, April 18th to the 20th. Um, we're very excited about this event, and also I'm excited because we do have a scholarship program for that as well. So for students uh, on uh, today's webinar, 
Uh, if this is something that might be interest of, uh, of interest to you, please do join us out there. Um, submit your name for the scholarship program. Uh, we're really looking forward to a great event, and thank you to our friends at Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI, uh, for supporting that scholarship program. Um, definitely looking forward to a great event, though. Uh, going to be able to have Governor Hickenlooper there. Um, he's fantastic. Uh, has definitely done a lot in his home state. Um, also, some senior leaders from companies like Nextera and uh, one of Craig's colleagues, uh, Ivor from Res. Um, so great to have Michael and Ivor joining us. And uh, for those of you who may have come across Bill Renner before, fantastic guy, really great speaker. He's worked on everything from city energy projects to consulting with the Pope in the Vatican uh, on the clean energy encyclical that was put out uh, about two years ago, I believe. Um, so uh, a great lineup of folks there. Students, uh, we do have a special rate for students who want to participate. And then uh, for people participating in today's call, for folks who come from the corporate world or otherwise are, are into their professional careers, um, we also have a discount code available that will provide you an all-in pass for all the networking and everything else that will happen there. Uh, the code uh, is here on the screen, intro ESA 15, AC 17. Um, and these slides will be available uh, after this presentation, uh, as well as a recorded version of this webinar uh, for distributing. There's definitely a lot of sort of introductory information that you can gain there as well. So we'll be hosting a number of pre-conference workshops um, that look at everything from uh, kind of an expanded version of what we talked about today that gets into more uh, of the details of storage, as well as an energy storage 201 course we offer. Um, and also for those uh, uh, involved with NECA, the National Electoral Contractors Association, um, we have a NECA training course on site. Uh, that will provide um, opportunities to learn more about the technical attributes of installing these systems and some of the codes and standards uh, that apply to that. So uh, definitely a great event to come out uh, to uh, join us in Denver for. We hope many of you will participate. And of course, our trade association uh, works on critical issues around markets and policy, as well as technology advancement. Uh, and for those companies joining us today, uh, definitely consider uh, if energy, if ESA may be a good fit for your company, uh, looking to grow this sector. Um, I believe with that, I will turn it back over to Sonora, though, uh, for some Q&A. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Matt. We have a couple questions here. Um, the first is, what um, type of permitting is involved for battery storage projects? I think that might be a question for either Craig or Peter, perhaps. I can take it on um, from uh, just we, we go through um, typical permitting for a storage system. I should say this, we would have the uh, rigorous interconnection process that we use as a utility. Uh, but as we look at um, how we permit with the cities, for example, um, I can't necessarily speak of that because we haven't actually kicked off our projects yet. Um, we're in the process of getting them done. But um, it would be very similar to um, some of the permitting that goes in with solar, for example, um, with the addition of a little bit more on the safety side of it as you look at the chemistry of the batteries. So uh, if you're familiar with the permitting process for solar, it would, uh, it would be pretty uh, relatively similar with that, just a little bit more addition on the safety side of it, and maybe depending on the size, some NEPR um, permitting that might be needed. But I'll let Craig answer that more from a developer standpoint. Yeah, the um, you know building permits, uh, and especially uh, with the you know fire um, permits with the fire uh, fire department are very important. Um, you know, and, and on an environmental basis, environmental basis, excuse me, uh, are the main ones we deal with. Another thing that's not necessarily permit, but the interconnection agreement, which is kind of a permit with the, uh, the utility or system operator, is also something that I'd put along those lines that are important. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question about um, certifications here uh, for you, Matt. Um, are there any certifications or trainings that interested professionals and students can pursue to learn more about the industry? 
Yeah, this is definitely a place where um, this is just starting to emerge as an opportunity for folks to get more involved in this industry. Um, while storage has been kind of quietly plugging away for the last couple of decades, in the last few years it's really accelerated companies are growing. So um, there are certifications uh, that, that get into the systems themselves. I know this is only part of the question you're asking, but there are things like UL certifications for systems and different technology certifications. Um, but when it comes to more professional designations, there's only a few programs in the country today and a few colleges that have uh, energy storage specific uh, types of programs in them. Um, but as Craig noted, there's a very diverse set of skill sets and jobs within the industry um, from engineers and folks working on system design to uh, actual integration into the grid and, and that type, uh, that scale of engineering on that side. Um, so many common certifications, or I don't want to say common, but many certifications available today uh, would be pursued and leveraged within the energy storage industry as well. Um, and that can be everything from uh, you know, the business development side to the system and technology side to the electrochemistry side as well, um, as well as environmental impact and, and a number of other uh, focal points there. Um, as to storage specific though, there is a limited number of opportunities out there that are that laser focused on just the storage segment. Uh, but it is continuing to grow, and, and it's definitely something that is important to the future of this industry uh, to can in, continue to have more opportunities like that available uh, as the workforce scales up to meet the, the significant demand for storage. Um, thank you. I have another question here. Um, I guess this could be for uh, Craig or Peter. Um, how, what is the average lifespan of uh, the storage units? How long do they typically last? Yeah, I can I can take that for you know I think as Matt said you know most of the systems deployed today are lithium ion and, and that's true of Res's portfolio and uh, you know I would look at it from a power plant standpoint um, you know the the cells themselves you know really depends on uh, the use case you know how hard they're being cycled um, you know that so that could go anywhere you know from three to ten years typically. Um, <clears throat> there's different strategies for how you would do that and, and, and be able to maintain that delivery of AC power for the duration over the life of the project. You could replace cells or you could augment and add uh, you know, fresh capacity onto it. Um, in the inverters or PCS uh, units, those typically have a 10 plus year lifetime. Um, the cells themselves you know, potentially can go longer than 10 years, but um, I think that's kind of what most people rely on things like the enclosure transformers switch gear you know those have lifetimes that are you know the same as uh, um, uh, what you would see in um, uh, you know with, uh, other other power uh, power uh, projects yeah, I'll also add to that I think Craig was right in differentiating between the cell uh, you know the, the kind of underpinning technology and an energy storage system. Um, you know, when a utility or, or even, you know, to an extent a homeowner or someone who buys an energy storage system, um, that's a full package of uh, different components, including all these kind of balance of system costs, like say an inverter or other pieces, um, and the underlying tech. Um, I went to a great installation. Uh, it was done by a company not on the phone today, so I won't mention their name, but we were in uh, just outside Indianapolis. And this is a, a large 20 megawatt, 40 megawatt hour, so you know, a full building uh, that when you go into it, it looks like a server farm. It just looks like kind of rows and rows and rows of batteries. Um, but what's actually kind of curious, and I think a lot of the reporters and others uh, who joined weren't aware of, as you walk to the end of those rows, there's a bunch of empty slots there. Um, and so those empty slots in the future, uh, as they've used the battery over, say, a decade or so, or used the system for a decade or so, uh, they may slide in new batteries into there. Because what they do is they show up and say, you know, we uh, want to make this project work for 20 years. Part of that strategy is, okay, if there is a, well, you know, also cell failure. If an individual cell uh, fails, then you'll replace it. Um, or if a cell starts to wane in its power output a little bit, you can augment the system by adding uh, additional uh, uh, storage cells to it. So uh, when, when looking at this from a customer perspective, 
you know, you're buying a set of applications that this uh, system is able to perform, um, and that will come with a contract and a warranty and guarantees to back up that system performance as well. Um, thank you. We just have one final question um, for Matt. Uh, what key policy factors are needed to facilitate increased storage adoption? Yes, yeah, so this is definitely an uh, area that is kind of the key to what the Energy Storage Association does. So thank you for that question. Um, you know, policy and markets really are driving factors for this. Um, and a very cynical answer would be, you know, there are places in this country where even if a storage system costs zero dollars, you would still be hard pressed to make a business case. Uh, and that's in part because markets just aren't really adapted to these new, uh, these newer technology. Um, you know, these systems have been going on the grid, uh, let's say, over the last 10 to 12 years where we've really started to see uh, meaningful storage installations for advanced energy storage. And this is all you know, markets that were formed 40 years ago uh, before these types of fast responding dynamic assets were, were thought to be uh, practical uh, and cost effective to deploy on the grid. So you know, now that we're seeing more storage, we're seeing um, uh, the different markets actually adapt to these technologies um, and also to uh, recognize the value that these systems are delivering. So the really big challenge that lies ahead for the energy storage industry is, one, to gain market access. Um, you know, to be regulated is to be recognized and to be accepted as a solution for a different markets. So we're looking for regulations that consider energy storage and value energy storage uh, on the system. Um, but in addition, it's going to need to permeate all portions of the energy industry. Uh, energy storage has value to deliver to the ratepayers, to the customers. Uh, it has value to deliver to companies and, and big corporations or industrial sites, as well as to utilities and co-ops and municipal power companies, um, as well as just systemic benefits like reliability and resiliency. And so each of these entities is, is you know, starting to engage in energy storage and start to get a better understanding of, okay, you know, what is my role in this? Uh, what are we going to own? What's the system going to do? Um, and, uh, and that's all a very good conversation for us to be having right now. Now, there are definitely some milestone policies out there, like an investment tax credit or some larger federal action uh, that could come in and uh, really uh, you know, propel this industry even faster to growth. Uh, but there's a lot of market fundamentals and regulation and uh, you know, uh, some uh, other aspects like that that need to be done or that day-to-day -day work in enabling energy storage to participate uh, in these market structures. So at ESA, we focus on both ends of that spectrum, pushing for the big breakthrough as well as doing that day-to-day, -day working with regulators, working with PUC commissioners, working with ratepayer advocates uh, to help advance energy storage uh, throughout the state. Okay. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, I see we're just uh, two minutes over the 3 o'clock hour, so we have to bring our webinar to a close. Um, if you had questions submitted in the chat box that we did not get to, we will be able to follow up with you um, after today's webinar via email. Um, I just want to thank Craig, Peter, Rickson, and Matt, um, and everyone for attending for today's, um, attending today's very informative session. Um, we appreciate the time, and we hope that you learned um, a lot about energy storage today. And if you have any questions regarding um, any upcoming events or webinars, please feel free to email us at education at energystorage.org. Thank you, everyone. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.